session. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My great pleasure to open the last session of this today's Russian conference of previous students. As I learned from the chair of the conference, no one wanted to chair this session. <laughs> and uh, well, I was asked to do it because I came late. <laughs> At the same time, if I'm standing, it would be more difficult to sleep for me, so <laughs> more benefits. Uh, let's talk, start with the first talk of this session, it will be presented by, uh, by Mr. Lee Ceramek, and his topic on its own utilization of solid solvents for high temperature removal of all-generated compounds from biolysis of Waste plastic, so please, the floor is yours. Have you shared your present? Yeah, yes, very good. Please. Thanks for the word. And uh, my name is Vich Ramek. My topic was already introduced, so it is. Uh, uh, I will continue on the presentation from the last year. So the last year presentation was more theoretical and the background. So now I will just in the beginning. So tell something briefly about the theoretical background of my research. So the biggest problem which is founded to my work is the increasing amount of the waste plastic and today's uh, possibilities of how to uh, do with this problem by mechanical recycling are a little bit limited. So if the European Union wants the goals they uh, proposed the higher amount of recycled plastics than the conventional waste, for example, mechanical recycling, cannot be uh, sufficient for this goal. So there should we should find out other ways, and one of the way could be uh, chemical recycling. And in our case, uh, we focus on the recycling by paralysis. But with this uh, kind of uh, way is. Uh, bounded by uh, problematic compounds, which we want to remove. And these compounds are mainly halogenated. And the problem with the halogenated compounds could be that uh, in the subsequent technologies, if they were in the products of the paralysis, they could damage, for example, catalyst or sub subsequent technologies, or even during burning, they could, uh, they could generate, for example, fluorinated, uh, Polychronite uh, the benzodioxines or the benzofurans. So we want to remove these compounds during the process and main sources of these compounds from the conventional waste are, for example, polyvinyl chloride or brominated flame attendants, which are used in plastics to uh, eliminate or to reduce hazardous behavior during fire. So our uh, specific uh, method is the high temperature removal of halogated substances from primary paralysis gas, which is gas before the condensation, so mainly in a vapor phase. Uh, and we remove these compounds on solid solvents. Now let's skip to our apparatus, which is focused on uh, removing halogenated compounds from modal gas. The core of the apparatus is the uh, electrically heated oven in which the reactor uh, with sorbent, with solid sorbent is placed. It is heated uh, at temperatures around 535 degrees Celsius to 500 to 50 degrees Celsius. And we prepare the mixture by mixing two, uh, in case of dry gas, two gases. In one cylinder, there is a non-condensing hydrocarbon. And in the third cylinder, there is diluted uh, hydrogen chloride, which uh, we can, which we use as the model compound uh, for the halogenated compounds. And the nitrogen here is just for purging and uh, cleaning the apparatus. And the precise uh, mixing is uh, is due to the use of uh, flow meters and. Uh, we can also measure uh, the concentration before the reactor and the measurements uh, of the outlet of the reactor are done here. So the outlet of the reactor goes to the impingers where 
uh, deionized water is placed and in this impingers we capture or absorb the hydrogen chloride which was not removed so and the complete uh, flow of the gas is measured by drug gas meter so we can uh, specify or we can calculate the concentration of the hydrogen chloride during some kind of period in the reactor. The second uh, apparatus is almost the same, but the difference is here uh, because we want also to model the condensing phase so we can uh, place uh, before the reactor, uh, we can uh, use a pump with, for example, in our uh, finished experiments with water and in a subsequent experiments with condensing organic phase, we can pump precisely the condensing phase. It should evaporate here and in the reactor, it should be in the vapor phase. Uh, and the procedure of the analysis should be the same. And I forgot to say that the analytic method here used for the it's offline and it's uh, ion chromatography, which could precisely measure the concentration of hydrogen chloride in the gas. Now, just briefly some pictures. On the left side, you can see a photo of the apparatus with connected computer, which could, uh, which is used also for data storing. Uh, the second picture is the uh, our uh, reactor for the sorption experiments. We have different diameters. And on the third picture, you can see one example of the sample. Uh, in this case, it's uh, sodium carbonate, uh, platinized, <coughs> and the size of these pellets is around two millimeters of thickness and width around four millimeters. So now to the experimental conditions and result interpretation. As I said, the temperature inside reactor, uh, as long as it's uh, electrically heated, it's between these temperatures. Usually it's stabilized around 540, but it depends on the, on which we uh, let into the reactor. For example, during uh, inlet of the water phase, it's somehow not so stable because of the capacity of the water. And the gas flow, which is controlled by the flow meters, is around, uh, it depends on the experiment condition, but usually it's from 90 uh, cubic decimeters per hour to 110 decimeters. And in that concentration in most of the experiments was uh, 2,100 ppm by volume. Uh, I would briefly say something about the relative time of sorption, which is our interpretation of the experiment and uh, the breakthrough curves. It is uh, relative time uh, divided by theoretical time, uh, oh, sorry, real time divided by theoretical time, and the theoretical time is based on the stoichiometric capacity of the sorbent, which means if all the content of the sorbent would be able to remove the hydrogen chloride, then this would be 100. And the real capacity, for example, from the breakthrough curves is the real time. So you will see it on the graphs. And we have also this kind of interpretation is a little bit limited, but uh, we can use it, for example, for the sorbents uh, at the same conditions. and especially the same sorbent because different sorbents have different capacity and different content of the effective substance. So the last thing for the experiments with uh, water vapor, the volume of the water vapor uh, in the gas mixture is around 43% by volume. So now let's go to the results. I will now show you some of the comparison in a dry gas, as you can see, there are some very non-promising uh, but waste uh, materials. This one is ash from the burning of the sewage sludge. And as you can see, the breakthrough curve is really short. And these sorbents looks really promising, but the problem is the interpretation because there is lower content of the effective uh, uh, substance and is a commercial sorbent. So it's not a pure, uh, for example, calcium hydroxide or calcium nitride, uh, nitrium, but uh, it has higher specific surface. So the values 
for example, the mass of the solvents you have to use for the sorption would be the same as in the case of cheaper solvents. And you can see that there are some, some of the solvents like limestones. It's like limestone from Chiskorice, limestone from Chetoriskode, mm -hmm. from uh, uh, Kaveka. And also there are some uh, solvents like uh, used catalysts. And also, as I mentioned, uh, the solvents based on calcium hydroxide, which showed very promising results. Now I will compare some of the experiments uh, and comparison of the dry and wet gas. And in case of uh, uh, sodium carbonate, you can see that the breakthrough curves are really similar. There is a little bit difference if we use water vapor and the relative time is, uh, I would say really short. So uh, it could be uh, caused by some of the surface properties of the sorbent. Now, if I skip to the most promising sorbent, calcium hydroxide, <coughs> as you can see, uh, the equilibrium concentration at the outlet is in case of calcium hydroxide, a little bit higher, but we aim to have it under 10 ppm by volume in the gas, so it's sufficient. And in the case of uh, dry gas, the breakthrough proof is uh, in the beginning, it, the concentration of hydrogen chloride is lower, but uh, there is some point where the wet gas uh, is behaving a little bit efficient, more efficient. Now, for example, of the limestone, this is limestone from Chiskovice, and this sorbent is uh, typical that it has a little bit uh, a higher amount of silicon in its uh, in its content. So, uh, for the results, you can see that in case of limestone, it usually is beneficial to have some water vapor in the in the vapor phase, and the breakthrough group is. Uh, we can achieve not 10 ppm, but we can use it, for example, uh, in a mixture to uh, because it's cheaper to ensure that uh, the higher concentration could be removed by this uh, cheaper sorbent. And uh, if you want to achieve lower values of the hydrogen chloride, we can use a more expensive one. Now, in case of uh, used catalyst, uh, which has uh, some content of iron in its composition, you can see that the effect is opposite. You can see that even if the breakthrough curve is really short, then the dry gas behave somehow, or the catalyst in the dry gas behave somehow better. Now, uh, you can see the comparison of the uh, how what mass of sorbent we have to use for removing gram of the hydrogen chloride. And for the conclusion, the, as, we, as I said, experiments on different solid sorbents uh, under similar condition at high temperature revealed some suitable sorbents for our experiments. And these suitable sorbents should be used for next experiment where we can uh, specify the conditions which could be uh, which could be um, similar or more close to the real gas in a pilot plant, which would be our ultimate goal to transfer these results from the model gas from lab to the pilot plant uh, at our industrial partner plant in the pyrolysis unit. And we also want to study experimental condition and apparatus configuration and or the effect on a yield of liquid gas and solid phase, which would be also important for your partners. Thank you for your attention. And now it's. Thank you for the time for one short, maybe maybe two questions. I'll ask. Um, you use hydrochloric acid for. Model system. Uh, it's not acid. It's dry hydrogen chloride. Oh, okay, okay, dry hydrogen chloride. But 
how well it would, uh, it would transfer if you use some larger compounds that the molecules will have much higher molecular weights. Yeah, we we come from the like basic uh, compounds and basic uh, mixtures to the more complex one because if something won't work on this on the basic one, then we assume that it won't work on the more complex one. So if we select some of the perspective solvent, then we can use, for example, also the organic chloride substances. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, okay, I have some question. Um, first of all, uh, you tested the mixture of the hydrocarbon gases for your tests. Uh, in our case, it was mainly methane. So yeah, the, for the, the picture there was just on the methane. Have you compared, for example, methane with some uh, really inert gas as an argon gas or something like that? Is there some influences of the methane? Like uh, at the beginning, we tried the mixture of hydrogen chloride with nitrogen, and the results were really similar. Maybe the some maybe it caused some kind of uh, black surface changes on the sorbent if you use methane, but we cannot be sure if it's maybe caused by some kind of uh, sealing we use in the apparatus because we use a reactor from uh, from uh, steel, stainless steel, and we have to use some kind of uh, sealing and uh, other things that would be similar to the apparat to the application in a real power. Uh, real and the limestone was the and calcium hydroxide was the best one. Because yeah. you skipped the results very quickly. That was, yeah, I can, we had sure almost no the chance to, to change the table. Yeah, as you can see, the result, yeah. uh, the, there was also limitage of the experiment mm -hmm. because we have a pump for the water mm -hmm. and it has limited a volume. So okay. we could go on for more than eight hours, but uh, it will be part of the next experiment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, Will, thank you once more. And with this, I'd like to invite the next speaker, who is Antonin Eder. Before he will roll this presentation, I would say the name of the presentation will be Adaptive Synthesis of Functional Unfiltered Dendrons for Drug Nanocarrier Assembly. So, yes, please share the presentation and Go to the presentation mode if possible. <coughs> See the maximum size. Yeah. yeah. We share it. And yes. the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to present my work. Uh, I'm Anton uh, from the group of Tomas Strashak and I would like to tell you something about the development of adaptive synthesis. So Amphitolic dendrons for drug delivery systems. So please let me first introduce you to the topic of work. Which one works? That you, the you one, the work. one that does work. I have removed the one that's broken. <laughs> okay. Maybe just click. Yeah. I will use the box. That's <laughs> right. Good. Yeah. Now let me first introduce you to the topic of uh, nanocarrier drug delivery systems. The most usual nanocarriers for drugs are uh, liposomes and micelles. Liposomes are supramolecular objects self-assembled from natural phospholipids, as for example, uh, lecithin, which are inherently amphiphilic. That means that they have a lipophilic part and hydrophilic part. And when put to water and treated <clears throat> properly, they assemble into such a bilayer where they point towards each other with their lipophilic tails, so that the whole liposome is hydrophilic from both outside and inside. Micelles are more simple objects. Here, the system simply hides the lipophilic tails from the hydrophilic environment. When it comes to the Drug delivery, liposomes are capable of delivery of both hydrophilic and hydrophobic drugs inside of the cavity. If the drug is lipophilic, it can also be delivered inside of the membrane. Micelles are more suitable for delivery of lipophilic drugs. However, 
I would like to say that MISOs are not as simple systems as we imagine them. And in recent decades, scientists uh, are developing nanocarriers, nanoparticles with advanced properties, as for example, optimal stability. And to obtain such nanoparticles, they are uh, preparing alternative amphiphilic building blocks. And one of such alternatives are amphiphilic dendrons. You can see an example here. Dendrons are molecules which have one part dendritic. That means branched with each branch carrying the same group. And this dendron, for, exa for example, uh, self-assembles into micelles. You can see the, let's say, real picture here, with very high drug loading capacity, 42% for doxorubicin. That's a huge number in this field. And because micelles are smaller than liposomes, they, they also show, show very high tumor penetration and other advantageous properties. And so this is where my work got inspired. I first found a way how to simply prepare in, let's say, two steps, a pilot substrate with two 12 carbon alkyl chains and three allyl groups. These allyl groups could be then used for uh, uh, attachment of polar groups using so-called thiolytic reaction. And by that, I attached uh, eight polar groups. So I had the synthetical protocol, which I could use in future. But what's also important from all of the substrates which I for, from all of the compounds which I prepared, only the compounds carrying ionic groups were dissolvable in water. And because the, one, uh, because the biological applications which we focus on require uh, solubility in water, I decided to focus on dimethyl ammonium and triphenyl phosphonium. So the next series was a preparation of compounds with dimethyl ammonium and dif uh, different lipophilic and uh, uh, with different lipophilic and hydrophilic domains. By the same procedure, I prepared another, another substrate with uh, 18 carbon chains. Then by very similar synthesis, I prepared two substrates with one alkyl chain and by slightly modified synthesis, here there is just one extra step. I first attached the, the dendritic wedge, then I deprotected ester group, then uh, I used the free carboxyl group to, to connect uh, uh, alkyl, alkyl chain used uh, via amylic bond. And lastly, I performed the thiolin click reaction. By this way, I prepared other two substrates with 12 and 18 carbon alkyl chain with two dendritic wedges. So in total, I had six ammonium uh, uh, dendrons, which were um, published this year. You can see that two of them have two uh, alkyl chains, two of them have one alkyl chain, and two of them have one alkyl chain, but two dendritic wedges. This series follows a simple trend from the most cylindrical to the most conical structures. And uh, from their studies, I think the most interesting results are computation using molecular dynamics. What you see here are, let's say, cores of the aggregates which they assemble into in pure water. What you can see is that as you, uh, as the polar part uh, makes, uh, is getting bigger, the size of the hydrophobic core or size of the core of the aggregate gets smaller. The same trend can be seen here. And as you go from the substrate with 12, 12 carbon chain to the substrate with 18 carbon chain, the core gets uh, bigger. The core, um, the size increases. There is only one exception, and that's this, this structure. The substrate with two 18 carbon chain has uh, such uh, optimal uh, <coughs> hydrophilic and lipophilic domain that it starts building double layer. 
However, once we uh, measured the dynamic light scattering, we didn't observe vesicles yet. It's a little bit complicated question, but uh, just simply said, this is an exception. Uh, so this is the series with ammonium groups on the periphery. Uh, the thing is that ammonium groups have a few drawbacks, and one of them is uh, higher cytotoxicity. So in the next step, I, by very similar procedure, I prepared the same series, but with triphenylphosphonium groups at the periphery. Uh, I attached, uh, by failing click reaction, I attached carboxyl groups, then using emetic coupling, I, I connected the phosphonium, and lastly, I performed ion exchange. So again, two substrates with two alkyl chains, two substrates with one alkyl chain, and again, by slightly modified synthesis, two substrate with two dendritic wedges. For such series, uh, I have forgotten to say, uh, the advantage was that phosphonium, uh, we expect the advantage will be that phosphonium groups <coughs> show lower cytotoxicity, uh, they facilitate internalization into cells so that uh, nanoparticles which have uh, triphenyl phosphonium on their surface get easier inside of the cell and they have other advantages. Here I, for example, measured dynamic light scattering. Uh, in water, the results were not reliable. I couldn't get proper correlogram if, if uh, you are familiar with dynamic light scattering. So these are just uh, rough results, but in uh, PBS, which is phosphate buffered saline, and physiological solution of salt, the results became very systematic. You can, for example, see that the substrates with 12 carbon chains always assemble into slightly smaller uh, properties, uh, into slightly smaller particles than in those with 80 carbon chains. But what is important from these studies, all of the all of the phosphonium series, if simply dissolved in water, most probably assembles into micelles, strictly micelles. Lastly, we wanted to extend the, the biological application potential. So we also um, uh, designed a synthesis for Unsymmetrical dendrons. Here uh, it's 10 step more complex synthesis, which I don't want to drown you in synthesis. So just uh, simply said, the overall yield was at approximately 20%, which is, I would say, quite good for 10 step synthesis. The idea of this is that if you add them to the mixture of, uh, let's say, 1 to 100 with their uh, symmetrical analog, the whole particle the whole final particle will carry the advantage of the auxiliary molecule. So for example, if this was fluorescent tag, the whole particle would be, would be uh, detectable by fluorescent uh, confocal microscopy or so on. So to conclude, uh, a modular synthesis for symmetrical and unsymmetrical amphibians was developed for series where, where they uh, were synthesized using this procedure. Uh, they vary in polar, on, in polar groups, number of alkyl chains, number of dendritic wedges, and presence of auxiliary molecule, and they are now tested uh, in cooperation. I would like to thank to all of my colleagues from the Department of Bioorganic Compounds and, and Nanocomposites, uh, to my supervisor in LCC Toulouse, where I got my internship, and to our colleagues from uh, Jan Evangelista Purkinje University in Ustina, London and to you for your attention. Thank you, and uh, the talk is open for discussion, so please, any questions? Uh, thank you for this uh, contribution. Uh, I was happy to see that in the end, you showed that you tested uh, your compounds in the saline. Uh, solution because yes. they're used in a physiological yes. uh, setting that that's important. Uh, I'd be interested in more details about this. Uh, does the because the um, I see the aggregates remain more or less the same, but does the solubility change? That uh, is there a sorting in or a sorting out effect? 
how that, and I, I'd be interested also in uh, if you could do the molecular simulations also in a saline solution, because that could be interesting. I am not familiar with computational. <laughs> okay. But I, I, I guess it is possible. It would be, it, it would be more relevant, you're, you're right. Um, as for the solubility, yes, I had to, for, for, especially for the, again, for the, sorry. Okay, I cannot go back anymore. <laughs> oh, anyway. Was it right? I think it... Ah, it's not, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, as, especially for the substrate with two 18 carbon chain, this one is so lipophilic that I had problems uh, when dissolving it in PBS. I had to sonificate it and it required a long procedure. But in the end, I had clear solution. I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't measure it otherwise. Yeah. Okay. So only in this case, there was obstacle. Yeah. But I somehow managed in the end. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Very good. One more question. <clears throat> in one study by Monica Miller, it was found that even less toxic than triphenylphosphonium groups were tris metoxyphenylphosphonium. Yes. I do consider it. Yes, amazing? yes. And I would like to uh, ex extend the series with this substrate before. If, if I have time for this, I would like to put it to the next article. You're right. It, if you have uh, uh, what uh, what uh, what we're talking about is not triphenyl phosphonium, but tri one methoxyl group on each phenyl here, <laughs> yeah. and the cytotoxicity got even much 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 lower. Yes, I already prepared the this module to connect it, but I didn't have time to do it yet. Okay, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. And with this, I would like to thank our speaker. Um, but because uh, Martin Kulsic is not here, according to my information, we will skip his talk and go to the last one. If there are no objections to this change of program, the last talk would be given by Wojciech uh, Hamala. Yes. Could I just ask you to share not the entire screen, okay. just the uh, just the uh, application because uh, then you can't see the this. yeah exactly. Okay. No. So the name of the talk is which uh, Amala is giving a talk named Taya, Hybrid Organ Metallic Galactin Inhibitors. So please look. The floor is yours. Uh, how do I start the slideshow? Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. My name is Wiki Amala. And I will have a small talk about the topic that is connected to my doctor thesis, which are hybrid organometallic galactin inhibitors. I will start with short introduction about galactins. Galactin are mammal proteins. In human, we have protein type of galactins. And in my research, I focus on galactin 1 and galactin 3. Galactins recognize saccharides units that contain beta-galacto-configurated sugars. We can find them both intra and outside of the cells, and they regulate many biologic functions, including immune response. Depending on the galactin's level, they either prevent or start apoptosis, and they help cell migration. Unfortunately, increased galactin levels are associated with many diseases. In my research, we're speaking mainly about cancer. Elevated galactin-1 levels contributes to tumor growth and health tumor uh, escape the immune response of the healthy immune cells. Elevated galactin-3 level increase invasiveness of the tumor into other healthy tissues. They help to help tumor to metastatic spread around the body, and they help to escape the immune response from the body as well. The natural ligands of the galactins are saccharides units containing beta-galactose. One of the most common ones is lactosamine. 
Lactose amine is disaccharide that is containing one galactose unit and one glucose amine unit. The binding between galactins and its ligands is usually expressed by dissociation constant KD. And the dissociation constant of uh, uh, lactose amine to human galactin 1 is around 130 micromole per liter, and to galactin 3, it's around 50 micromole per liter. Uh, the binding is caused by the hydrogen bonds between the hydroxyl of the carbohydrate and the amino acids of the galactins. The galactin 1 and galactin 3 have really similar binding plates, so it's quite difficult to create structures that are selective to only one of the galactins. Usually, most of the natural and synthetic ligands has better affinity to galactin-3. However, not all of the hydroxyls are responsible for the binding. Only these that are green are bind to the galactins. The rest of them do not participate at all. On the contrary, if we substitute the hydroxyl with something that usually contains a ring, a ring group, we can create additional interaction between the galactin and the ligand. These unnatural ligands then have better affinity to the galactins and they can act as a, a quite potent inhibitor. If they are in the body, the galactins will rather bind these unnatural ligands than the natural ligands, thus they cannot do their proper biological function. One of the best prepared galactins inhibitor is this structure called TD139. Its core of this structure are two galactose units binded by a sulfur, and both galactose units are uh, substituted by triazole and metachlorphenyl group at both, uh, both ends. We can see that the affinity to galactin ones in it, it is in hundreds of micromole per liter, and to galactin three, it's all to, it's in thousands micromoles per liter. This uh, structure recently passed second phase of clinical trials successfully. So our idea is we have this known galactin inhibitors that have RN functional group. RN functional group have usually no biological function. But what if we exchange this RN with something that also contains RN, but also contains something, in our case, some organometallic complex that has its own biological function, either cytotoxicity to tumor or antimetastatic activity against the tumor. Can we create a hybrid molecule that can both inhibit the galactin and keep its cytotoxicity or antimetastaticity? We are working with three different complexes. First one are ferrocene complexes. Ferrocene is really cheap, really stable on air or in water solution, and they are easy to prepare. Depending on the ligand, they can be quite cytotoxic. And because it's such a famous moiety, there are already many electrochemical methods how to detect or watch it, what it does in a cell. The second one are ruthenium RNs. Ruthenium RNs are generally completely non-toxic. However, they have high anti-migratory and anti-invasive properties. They prevent the tumor from metastasis. Also, because they have a suitable transitional metal, we can use some electrochemistry to study them. The last one are ruthenium pyridines. Instead of benzyl, vanyl here, we have pyridine here. And this small change and the small change in complexation causes a huge uh, increase in cytotoxicity. These are really cytotoxic, even 10 times higher than the drug cisplatin. To create all of these complexes, we need sugar that contains azide. I don't have enough time to go deep into the synthesis, so I will show just a summary of synthesis of the two most biological active compounds. Starting from the glucosamine hydrochlorates, we can use a chemical sequence from six to eight steps, depending on which one we want to get. We create a glucosamine acceptor suitably protected with azide at either position one at position two. The Hydroxyl free, it's uh, the hydroxyl at position four, it's free to glycosylation in further step. Starting from a commercially available level glucosan, we can use five step chemical synthesis to introduce the azide at C3 position and change the configuration at C4 position into galacto configurated sugar. 
Then next five step, and we can create a suitable tile the galactosides. Two galactose unit, both with azide at the C3 position connected by sulfur, similar to the TD139 drop. Or we can open the 16 drop circle and create a glycosyl donor. Having the glycosyl donor and prepared glycosyl acceptor, we can conduct the glycosylation, thus creating the saccharide, and then free the protection step to get us uh, unprotected derivative, derivative of lactosamine with azide at C3 position. Having these azide containing saccharides in hand, we can go into the complexation reaction. The easiest case is with the ferrocene. We take the sugar azide, we take the commercial available ethyl ferrocene, and we conduct the azide alkene quick reaction, really reliable, getting us the complex. In some cases, due to easier separation, it's better to use acetylated sugar and contact the final deprotection of the final complex. Ferrocene has no problem with the basic conditions. This way, I have created 21 different compounds, analogs of galactose, lactose, lactosamine, and thiolic galactosides. We have measured cytotoxicity of the compounds, the affinity to galactines, and we have picked eight, which had the best biological results. And we have decided that from this eight, we will try to create ruthenium analogs. The ruthenium RNs are created in a two-step chemical sequence. In the first step, we used azide alkyne cyclo addition of sugar and phenyl acetylene, giving us an intermediate, which then react with this ruthenium tetramer. This ruthenium tetramer is really unstable on air, so this whole second step has to be in really oxygen-free condition, otherwise this will react with air and not with my sugar and I will get nothing. This way, I got five compounds, analogs of galactose, lactose, and lactosamine, and I have three in progress, other, other derivatives of galactose and the main thiolic galactosides. Similar case is with the ethyl pyridine. I used the colic reaction with uh, ethyl pyridine, and then I used the complexation with this ruthenium dimer. Fortunately, this ruthenium dimer is stable on air, so I can use... Uh, pretty much reaction to only in the digester. These complexes are usually orange. These complexes are white or brownish, depending if I have some impurities there. And these complexions are nicely yellow. I have prepared two of them, and six are in progress. With the complexion in hand, and in cooperation with engineer Magdalena from IOC Pra, we use fluorescent anisotropy to measure their affinity to human galactins 1 and human galactins 3. We have found out that ferroxen is a viable bioisosteric replacement in all tested positions. So if I have a galactin inhibitor that is RN, I can replace the RN with ferroxen, and it will not change the affinity to galactins much. The dissociation constant correlates with the dissociation constant of the saccharide inhibitor, of the, of the parent inhibitor. Maybe the only difference is that in many cases of the ferrocene compounds, we have found a selectivity to galactin 1. If we can, here we can see the KD of the uh, lactosamine, and here we can see the KD of this prepared analog of lactosamine. We can see that the affinity raised about 40 times to galactin 1 and only 7 times to galactin 3. If we create the inhibitor from the TAD139, we can get this complex. And we have found out that this complex has pretty much the same affinity to galactin 1 as TD139, which is great. Not many complexes does that, almost nothing. However, we lost the affinity to galactin 3, which is probably even better, because usually the affinity to galactin 3 is better to than to galactin 1. But for some cases, we're working on crystal structure, so we know more. We got really nice structure with nice selectivity to galactin 1. Also, we have measured uh, affinity to galactins uh, from two prepared ruthenium RNs complexes. And both of them have nice selectivity to galactin 3 and almost no affinity to galactin 1. And we haven't tested the ruthenium purities.
In cooperation with uh, Dots and Herska from Reka Moberno, we have measured cytotoxicity of those compounds. Cytotoxicity is expressed as IC50, which is a concentration that is needed to reduce cell proliferation by 50%. We measured the cytotoxicity against four different cell lines, uh, resistant, highly metastatic ovarian cancer cell lines, SKOV3, uh, less resistant ovarian cancer cell lines, A2780, embryotic cell lines, HEK293, which simulates healthy cells, and uh, again, highly metastatic, highly resistant ovarian cell lines, NDA and B231. Here in comparison are the IC50 of drug cisplatin. We have found out that majority of the ferrets and complexes are non-toxic. We have three exceptions. Two of them are these analogs of galactose, both of them bearing functionalities at position one and position three. And especially this one bearing two ferrocents has a great nanomolar cytotoxicity and great selectivity against resistant ovarian cancer cell lines, SKOV3. The last exception is this derivative of lactosamine, which is completely not cytotoxic, again, healthy, embryotic, HEC293 cell lines, and has a nice cytotoxicity against MDA and B231 cancer cell lines. One would think that the cytotoxicity is caused by the two molecules of ferroxine. However, this molecule, which has the best binding to galactins, is not cytotoxic at all, which seems that the cytotoxicity is not caused by interactions with galactins, but some other reasons. Uh, all preparing ruthenium RNs are non-toxic, and we haven't tested the ruthenium pyridines. Last biological activity that I would like to talk about <laughs> is anti-migratory and anti-invasive properties. Maybe your time is over. They yeah. Stop you here. Okay, I'm sorry. I was sad that my colleague couldn't be here. <laughs> so I get Thank it. you. I'm sorry. <laughs> At any international conference, your mic will be switched off at this point. I know. Any questions? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for your for your talk. Um, sorry, you couldn't make it until the mm -hmm. end. But, uh, anyway, you uh, were talking about ruthenium pyridine being ten times more toxic than the cisplatin. Mm -hmm. I know this is not your field of expertise, mm -hmm. but I'd be interested anyway if you had a look at these. Because cisplatin uh, is a very potent cytotoxic mm -hmm. uh, uh, compound, uh, but it also has a host of side effects. Yes. So if you use something that's tenfold more potent or more toxic than, than cisplatin, then we it, need what the side effects would look like, because uh, I just can't cis imagine. Cisplatin uh, <laughs> has side effects because it uh, attacks or causes the same effect to every cell that proliferates. Mm -hmm meaning it will cause yeah. bad stuff to tumor, it damages the DNA. However, it will damage all other cells that proliferate. Yeah. So if we have something that is more potent, however, it has the selectivity against the cancer cell lines, mm -hmm. be, be either that it contains saccharides and tumor has much higher uptake of saccharides than the healthy cells, okay. or it interacts with the proteins that are <laughs> overexpressed in the tumor. Mm -hmm. Thus, it will, uh, more hard the tumor because it interacts with this protein mm -hmm. or it's uh, automatically concentrate because the substance will concentrate in the presence of high concentration of the proteins that will interact, meaning it will cause more harm to the tumor than to the... To the whole yeah. So and, it will be selective to... Yes, the and one last thing. Uh, usually the lower concentration of the compound we need to kill the tumor, the less the side effects. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks again. Thank you. And with this, I would like to thank you all for attending the last mm -hmm. session, especially the speakers and the committee members. And uh, originally we planned to close the conference at two o'clock and then at 3 30 have the announcement of the winners is it still valid or do you want to put shift it because we have it depends time. on the rest of the jury if it's okay to shift the end to 1500 because we will be quick in deciding that it's fine by me so uh, okay so we will meet here uh at three o'clock
for the announcement of the winners of the conference. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you also uh, for being here both these days. I would like to thank the jury members, both those who are permanent and the external members who volunteered to be here today with us because that this is uh, not, not, not really evident. Uh, I think we've had a nice display uh, of the wealth of research at our institute over these two days. And I hope it was interesting for all of you to, to step out of your comfort zone and to, uh, to, to see the topics uh, that are worked on by your, by your colleagues and perhaps find some inspiration. Uh, so uh, thank you for this. Uh, I would like to remind you that you can vote for your, for your favorite presentation. I will move the box from back there to the little table in, in the entrance hall because we will be staying here and, and uh, discussing your presentations. So by, uh, say, quarter to three, I will have a look and take it back and count the votes and see who won. So thank you once again and hope to see you next year <laughs> in good health. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.